Mark, go. All right. One of the things that we haven't really gotten deep into was Jacob Waltz. I mean, after all, this is all about Jacob Waltz. The story of Jacob Waltz is a pretty simple one. It's documented. Yet, probably most of what everybody knows and has heard about it is the mythology. So, what happens is History Channel decides to make him into this drunken, murderous... I, I, I can't even remember how they describe Jacob Waltz. I don't think they put him in any historical context whatsoever. And it was so disappointing because that was something completely out of our hands. But it bought into what the the non-fictional books that are almost fiction, how they portray him. And for a person that actually is documented and is a real person, and it's a treasure story, a lost mind story that's real, it's very disappointing when you have an actual story and you have documents to base it and back it up and base everything on. And the group that calls themselves History Channel doesn't even take a minute to make sure they get everything right. So we have to dispel the notion that Jacob Waltz is this murderous, drunken prospector gone mad. Instead, let's remember, Jacob Waltz applied for citizenship in the United States and not just Mississippi, then traveled to the gold fields of California, becoming a naturalized citizen of the United States in Los Angeles County, California, traveling then into the 1860s into the Prescott area, where he filed three claims that we know of, the Gross Load, the Big Rebel, and the General Grant. By 1869, he turns up and settles in Phoenix, Arizona in the general area of 16th Street and Buckeye Road, known then as Henshaw Road. While there's documents that show his signature, there's no documents that show that he could necessarily read or write English fluently. We don't even know how well he spoke English. We can assume it, but we do know Julia Thomas and Reinhard Petrash spoke generally in German to him. Reinhard had emigrated from Germany with his family, the Petrash family, and Julia had grown up in a household where German was the primary language used in the household. So they made it very clear that they generally spoke to Waltz and a lot of the time Waltz spoke in German. So while he would have some English or he could have spoke English somewhat fluently, we do know he preferred to converse in German. We know where he settled, he had a farm. A couple of the documents show us that someone tried to settle on his property. He asked that they be brought off of that property. We know that he tried to have his, um, his had everything transferred from his name to the, brother, the Star Brothers because of an illness that he recovered from. And part of that deal was they would get all his things and his property in return that they would care for him and he'd be allowed to live in his property until his death, which did actually happen though they didn't care for him in the end. Uh, another article that's probably pretty well known and usually taken advantage of is where there was a murder on his property. One of the things everybody always tries to, the part of the myth-making process is what really happened during this murder. But the problem is it gives us a good description of Waltz. He's an elderly prospector who's basically retired as a farmer, living in his adobe house on his property. He doesn't hear very well and he doesn't see very well. And it just fits with probably where he was in life. Um, 
but in no terms any of the documentation anything we see ever puts him out as someone who's going into town going on drunken drinking sprees someone who's literally a madman he seemed to be well liked maybe not as well known but he seemed to be a small farmer living in a community that was growing around him and as he was becoming elderly he ended up finding friends and part two of those friends that he found that he spent considerable time with were Julia Thomas and Reinhardt Petrash. He spent a lot of time at Julia's bakery. He sold them what we're told and from this came from Julia he'd sell the duck eggs that the ducks laid on his farm to Julia for the bakery. Um, Julia was able to promote this bakery and find some success with it. Her husband had been something of an entrepreneur and a number of failed businesses, but the bakery soda fountain situation with her name on it, with her in the back in the kitchen, seemed to become very successful. Um, Walt's frequented the place when her husband left him. That's when the story starts to evolve. That Walt, she needed assistance. Um, her husband had run off with the money. Waltz came in said, look, show me the bills, show me the receipts, show me what you need and we'll take care of things. And Julia did not understand how this poor old man who farmed and brought her eggs would be able to handle these things. But sure enough, he paid off her debts. He got things straightened up, got her back on her feet at that time period. What additionally happens at that time, he talks to Julia and Reinhardt and starts to befriend them and they become closer. But at this time, still during that time period, they make sure that it's very clear they're not sure how to ask him where this gold came from. There doesn't seem to be a story around town. All the mythology built up of everyone knew and tried to follow him to his mind. This doesn't seem to happen because Julia and Reinhardt seem to be unaware completely that this is some old prospector that has this extremely rich mind that everyone's trying to follow. Instead, it seems to be this is their friend and they're not quite sure where he came up with this. They're curious but they don't want to insult him or cause a problem by inquiring or asking him. So what happens is, on December 25th, Julia's birthday, they're sitting around talking, they had a nice picnic, and it's Christmas Day, and they're looking out the east to the mountains from Waltz's porch, and Waltz just suddenly out of the blue points and says, my mind's out there in those superstition mountains. And there's where the story truly begins because he begins to tell them a tale of how he was out there and he came, he met the, the Peraltas and that he and his partner went to this mine. And the story begins in that process. It wasn't a story that they heard anywhere else. It was something he volunteered as this is where it is. The story in, as well as he's like trying to make plans with them is look, I got some stuff out there in the mountains. We need to go back, grab that stuff, bring it back and it's more than enough for us. He makes it very clear none of the three of them have any business mining up in the mountains. They're going to his camp where he has a bunch of ore. The ore is more than enough than they will ever need. We'll get that, we'll get out of the mountains. I can tell you about where the mine is, but we're not going to the mine, we don't need any tools. It's very clearly laid out. So before they can make the trip into the mountains, of course you know what happens. We have the flood. And the flood comes in and wipes out Waltz's property. Reinhardt Petrash goes out, finds Waltz after Julia's notice he hasn't been reported. She hasn't heard anything from him in days. Reinhardt goes out to check on him, finds him. up In some stories he's in a tree. Some stories he's up on just the last of the walls of the building or standing on his bed. But anyways, he's been out there for days in the freezing cold in the water. They bring him back in. This is February. Waltz kind of seems to get better, worse, better, worse, all through the summer until October. Talking to them, trying to hopefully get well enough to take them back into the mountains to kind of show them the route, the general area, do something to kind of show them where they need to go. Fortunately, he succumbs to his illness in October and he dies in Julia's home, which is documented in a newspaper story, and buried the following day in the Pioneer Cemetery, at that time known as the Loosely Cemetery in Phoenix. Uh, Reinhardt Petrash, his brother, George, is buried next to Waltz, and that was kind of the end of that part of the tale. Um, Reinhardt and Julia then decided, after settling some things up and pulling things together, start making their initial trips into the mountains. Um, well, we won't go into detail at this time. The thing is, when they finally finished those initial trips and Reinhardt became very frustrated of what was happening, 
he turned to Jim Bark at his ranch while they where they stopped after they came out of the mountains and told Jim Bark the story. Jim Bark spoke to Julia, found out the story synced up. They had almost identical matching stories word for word. He started thinking about the mine. He, in fact, coined the phrase Lost Dutchman Mine because he figured Lost Deutschman didn't seem to work as well. And then later became partners with a gentleman named Sims Ely. And then Ely later, while Reinhardt wasn't in town, did sit down with Julia Thomas and spoke to Julia several times and found the story was almost still identical to the story that they told Jim Bark originally. And that was the basis of all these legends. Um, the Jim Bark manuscript is still available. Um, people, it circulates through people, though it's never been published. Um, it has a number of different stories concerning the superstitions and treasures and a lot of things. Very, very interesting read. And Sim Zeely's book is very difficult to find called The Lost Dutchman Mine. But again, it's based on Jim Bark's notes and his manuscript and kind of furthers and tells other parts of the story not you know, mentioned in Barks. But um, that is the initial and the beginnings of Jacob Waltz and the Lost Dutchman Mine. Um, generally, if anything outside of that is speculative, it's usually brought in. It's And unfortunately for us nowadays, so much of the information we get from people is fraudulent. They're just looking to make a name for themselves or try to speak out a turn and Unfortunately, if you go out and you say it loud enough and strongly enough and you overpower people, it sometimes becomes truth. And again, one of the things we've tried to hear in doing this program is always just take the documents, the facts, the truth, and just follow forward in the truth. While there's so many other stories we will get into and in details on Jacob Waltz and some of that, some of the little smaller pieces of that puzzle, um, probably right now, best to get back to our story. How you feeling? My leg hurts both of them. When we were up on uh, Coronado area, like I said, it's very steep, and, it, and it's it, you got to really watch what you're what you're doing because you get these little round rocks laying on bedrock, and you step on one, you're going down. Unfortunately, this happened to Trevor where we were coming down off of it. Luckily, the truck was within distance that we could reach it, and there was four of us there. So we were able to help Trevor go from the point where he fell back to the truck. And it, it wasn't easy, but we were lucky that way. Sometimes you're lucky, and sometimes you're not. I remember when we were filming, we were up on up above the upper Fish Creek, and there's these huge cliffs that go straight down and there's a path that follows the edge and I'm trying to keep away from that edge and one of our cameramen he's walking right on the edge and there's always little rocks laying on the ground and I looked at him and I said if you step on one of those rocks you're gone there's no way you're gonna fall off that cliff and survive we only have several access points but one of the interesting aspects that I've run into is early on one of the few times we ran into somebody was in that general area. A guy got up, parked his truck, sat there with binoculars and watched us for a period of time. Um, this is back probably during the first couple episodes we did last year. Um, he spoke out to us and yelled out. We couldn't hear what he was saying when he left, but we weren't quite sure of the thing. This time what was very odd is as the camera's panning, I look up and I know that I th I'm, th I'm thinking I caught some of it on the camera, but there's this guy came up over the rise towards us as we were getting Trevor out and he seemed completely taken aback when I looked at him that we were that close to him and then he just kind of like did a abrupt turn and went off to the wet side and then he just dropped off the the side of the, the mountain there um, I'm sure he wasn't jumping off the mountain but it was you could tell he did not expect us to be right there and he was looking to make a quick exit as um, soon as we got down we heard that we heard a truck and the truck's gone um i tried to get over and see if i could get the picture or some film or something footage of the vehicle leaving when we got down there was an individual that actually recognized us from the tv show he knew who we were we were in the area he had been actually out trying to recover a drone that he had lost out there um he was waiting down for us we got down and we started talking we asked him hey well, what was with that guy and he said that guy just came hightailing it down didn't say anything jumped in his truck got in his truck took off around the corner and took off 
So what was the deal with this guy? What was the whole situation? We can joke all we want, but it's more its more than one time now we've had a vehicle out there, someone watch us, and then just suddenly abruptly leave when we take notice of them. And uh, you don't know what to think of it. Is someone just keeping an eye on you? Is someone just cur the curiosity of what's going on? We don't know. There was nothing messed with in the truck. All our equipment that we had in the truck was still fine and safe. We were all good. Of course, we had the numbers in the situation, even though Trevor was incapacitated. But um, what was this individual doing? And, you know, he could have just played it off, waved at us, kind of looked around and walked back. You know, hey, you guys okay? He could have done a lot of things, but abruptly turning and taking off a different direction than he came from just to go back and circle around to get back in his truck and leave. Um, that that was very odd, puzzling, almost puzzling, and I'm hope we caught that him in the background because it really kind of threw me off that we're dealing with Trevor and I had to keep on that situation, but having to watch him, that kind of threw me off at the moment. It's the Legion. When you're in this area, you do hear rumors about the Black Legion. Our experience has been. On more than one occasion, we've had somebody watching us. It's very suspicious. Uh, just like when we were up in the area where Trevor fell in Coronado. Off in the distance, we could see a guy climb up over the ridge just to where he could see us. Then as soon as he realized we spotted him, he takes off down a hill, gets back into his truck, and takes off. Now, there was another person down by our truck who happened to be a fan of the show and recognized us. He said it was really weird. He said this guy came running down the hill, jumped in his truck, and drove off. Now, when we were down in Fish Creek, on each side of Fish Creek, there's these huge cliffs. And up on one cliff, in an area where no one would go, we could hear a noise up there. And there was somebody walking along a cliff following us. So, what's behind that? I mean, we don't tell people when we're going out. Uh, do they recognize our vehicle? Do they, they want to know what we're doing? Are they watching over something? We just don't know. So, leaving the mountains, um, we packed up all the gear, we got safely out, and lo and behold, next thing we know is the, you know, Apache Trail is blocked. Um, the uh, Maricopa County Sheriff's Department had it blocked off. All traffic stopped. We get out. We walk down the road. There's a helicopter re helicopter rescue going down in the canyons below. Guy, I guess, in cowboy boots. I guess he was wearing cowboy boots because that's what he seemed to have on his feet when he came out. They brought him out. But he had slipped and fallen down in the canyon below. Um, again, I think his injuries involved, I think he had a broken pelvis, um, a broken shoulder, um, several other severe injuries came out very fortunate that he's alive i'm um, very fortunate he had a friend that was able to crawl make his way out get to the road and be able to get assistance there is not much telephone service through some of that area so he was fortunately able to get the telephone service to get the deputy sheriffs out there to get the rescue um and, and i'm sure you know looking back at it probably it was just a stupid thing it was probably not being prepared not being having the right equipment the right gear and maybe the right knowledge practical knowledge and putting themselves in that situation and it could have been someone experienced because it happens to them too same thing i've known people that have climbed for years very experienced climbers and just one thing happens and next thing you know is that person's in deep deep trouble and so just fortunately we were fortunate enough not only to catch what we saw it was another circumstance of where you're learning another lesson on the way out how lucky we were that there was nothing severe we didn't need any need any evacuation we were able to get back out the last mile to the truck but it opened our eyes again to the things that do happen in the superstition mountains so lesson learned happens to everybody happens at every turn happens in every circumstance and you don't want it to be you because it, it's just it's you know you, you can't even imagine how much pressure that puts on that person and, and and everything and you know the fact that he's just lucky He's just lucky they were able to get the phone service and get the sheriff's department out there and they were able to rescue him and bring him out of there safely. Line up there because um, they're holding up the traffic, right? Trevor, we'll get closer pictures that well, way. Just pull up behind that car and get out. Yeah, that's true. Are they?
they got some. Mark. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Throughout the history of the Superstition Mountains, there's been, we always speak of the mysterious deaths, disappearances, and things like that. 
But more tragic is so often the people that perish in the mountains due to heat exhaustion, heat stroke, um, diabetes, heart attacks, and, and we've come across them. Randy and Wright and I came across a guy who went into diabetic shock and ended up having a heart attack at um, Garden Valley one day and they had to rescue him, bring in the helicopter and rescue him out of D Garden Valley. Um, it, it's a very real thing. Um, and these type of things can affect you at any given time. It doesn't matter how old, how young, where you're at, and one of these things can happen. Um, the tragedy also happens to so many people that think, you know, I'm going to take this thing on. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. And even in the best of circumstances and the best of weather, and we have the mysterious, you know, the disappearance of the three men from Utah who um, Rick Gwynn, my good friend Rick Gwynn, found um, two of the gentlemen up on Yellow Mountain. And then later they found one of the other gentlemen, and we've, we've discussed that. Um, and they perished. They were out during the summer. Jesse Capens, who went up, came in through Tortilla. They found his empty camp. And I believe it was a year or so before they found the remains of Jesse, finally. Um, it's just something that happens more frequently than you would imagine. And it's just recently there's several people that have contacted me and I have been in touch with that do the same thing, whether it's the summer heat, it's the winter, it's the cold, it, it, it's just, you have to take a great care, you have to plan, you have to let people know where you're at. Um, you have to make sure that everything's coordinated, someone knows where to get you, the right people know who the right people to contact. I'm Superstition Search and Rescue, and you have Pinal County, you have Maricopa County, you have the Volunteer Search and Rescue that operate out of the general area. Um, there's always Dutch Hunters, because in my case, Knowing the area I'm in and the people that know me, I think the best planning for me is to let those people know because they can give them more site-specific areas of targeting, knowing where I travel, where I've been, um, different routes I may take in or out of the mountains. But cannot stress enough is always go in not just prepared yourself, but prepare others to know. Make sure there's a map, there's coordinates, something of a plan, an alternative plan, where you're planning to park the car. Someone, even if you want no one to know, you can take it, put it in a sealed envelope. Say, hey, if I'm not back in the 24 hours I planned, hey, open the envelope, bring out the information, call these numbers. I always use phone numbers and Greg Davis, Jack Carlson, those phone numbers are always listed for it. Randy Wright, Tom Collinborn, those people are the people that the phone numbers I leave because they're going to know the right people to contact that if I don't come out of the mountains in the right time, here's the people you call to find me, okay? Um, can't stress that enough. I hope this is a bit of a lesson learned, what everybody's been able to watch. But um, again, we're still going to have those circumstances. We're going to still have those tragedies. The idea is to minimize them. And um, there's nothing worse, you know. Most of the time we're out search and rescue, we realize after the first day or two, we're not doing a search and rescue anymore. We're doing a recovery. And it's probably one of the hardest, saddest things there is to do is you have someone's family members pleading. They start talking to you and next thing you know is you have to deal with all that tragedy all that stress all that sorrow all of everything that these best families are dealing with the loss of a loved one